Y'all hear those horns. Y'all know what time it is. It's time to play some toss. Welcome everyone to the Tristan on Sports Show, episode 15 of Toss. This is your friendly neighborhood, T-Square, Tristan Thomas. Thank you for joining us. Glad you can be here. Glad to be here with you. And let's get right into the state of the state and let's talk about something dominant. We got to travel to Green Bay, Wisconsin and talk about something dominant because that's exactly what this performance was. The Packers dominate the Cowboys 28 to 7 this past Sunday. And a lot happened. Now, when I say a lot happened, I mean two things happened. And guess what? Those two things were two suggestions that yours truly, your friendly neighborhood, T-Square, Tristan Thomas, your boy, made suggestions about for weeks on end right here on Toss. If you guys listen, and again, if you do, thank you so much. But if this is your first time listening and you haven't traveled back through the other 14 episodes that we've done, you will know that just two weeks ago, I called for an adjustment to this offense. I called for this offense to turn into a run first, run oriented offense. With the passing game being something on the side. Another suggestion, another suggestion that I made a few weeks prior to that was for Mike McCarthy to take the reins of the play calling again. It needed to be done. Those two things were suggestions that I made right here on toss. Those two suggestions came to fruition this past Sunday against the Cowboys as Mike McCarthy took the reins over a play calling. And you saw the difference. He changed the style of play. Not only did he take over play calling again, but he also made this offense run oriented. The first four plays he dialed up were running plays with Eddie Lacy, who we'll get to him in a little bit. A lot of people have been jumping down McCarthy's throat about what is he doing? What, what, what the hell are you doing? Why why isn't this team getting better? Why why is why is this happening? Why is that happening? Do you not have a pulse on your team? W- don't you see the same things that we see? Myself included, there were some adjustments that I just t- spoke about that we made suggestions about that I didn't understand why they weren't happening and how come he wasn't seeing this. I think with the moves that he made this past Sunday of him taking the play calling duties back and changing the style of this offense up to being a run-oriented def- uh, run oriented offense really shows that he does, in fact, have a finger on the pulse of this team. He is well aware of what's going on with this team as a whole. He saw something needed to be done, and he did something about it. Now, the naysayers are going to say, well, he waited too damn long. We we could we could still be undefeated if he was calling plays and, and 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 we were running the football that way. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter now. This is the way things are now. He is going to call the plays, and I think he's he. I don't think he's going to relinquish play calling ever again. Because you saw the difference, and I think he's smart enough to know what's working, what isn't. Your passing game is not top notch this season. Period. You have to come to that realization. And I think he has come to that realization. That's why he ran Eddie Lacy 24 times. That's, he, that's why he ran James Starks another 11 times. Randall Cobb got a couple of carries. Aaron Rodgers scrambled out of the pocket and made some good games. Some good gains. This Sunday proved that Mike McCarthy does have a finger on the pulse of his team. He is well aware of what's going on in every facet of the game. He reestablished his worth as one of the best play callers in the NFL, period. I dare somebody to argue with me on that. Yes, he had some game management issues in last year's NFC Championship game. But that had to do with more than play calling. There's a lot of other stuff that went down in that game to cause that meltdown. He is one of the best play callers 
in the NFL, period. And you saw that on display this past Sunday. You saw a much better Packers offense. Much better on third down, which is a money down, which is Aaron Rodgers has been historically good on third down in his career. They've been pretty damn bad. This season, they go seven to 14 on third down this past Sunday. That's the money down. That's the down where you're going to move the change, keep move the chains, keep moving forward, trying to get yourself in scoring position to put points up on the board and hopefully punch it in for six. He really does have a finger on the pulse of this squad. Had they even had they lost, I would have still said he has a finger on the pulse of the squad just because the offense came to play. They played so much better. And people forget the Cowboys have a good defense. I believe they were fifth ranked. You put up 28 points against the fifth ranked defense. You're, I mean, that's that's pretty good. So it's not like they were playing against a cupcake defense. They weren't. They were playing against a very stout defense. Sean Lee, as much as some people hate him, Greg Hardy. They were out there still making plays. They made it tough for a little bit, but overall, that offense got back on track. We can see if they're going to keep on track. But let's go into the let's dig into this offense a little bit. Aaron Rodgers, 22 of 35, 218 yards and two touchdowns. This was not the big MVP type of game from Aaron Rodgers. And we've grown accustomed to saying that pretty much all season. This is not a squad where you're going to get that. And nor should it be. This passing game is not what it used to be this season. We've all seen that. We've gotten 13 games worth of that. This passing game needs to be a complement to this running game. And that's exactly what it was. That was the game plan. And you you saw it. The suggestion that we spoke here about on toss came to fruition. Eddie Lacy, 24 carries, 124 yards, and a touchdown. Got a couple of screen passes, made some games in the, in the passing, and made some, some plays in the passing game. I don't know what he and Mike McCarthy spoke about, but whatever they spoke about, bury the hatchet, clean slate, whatever you want to call it, he came out and he was the Eddie Lacy we all remember. He was that guy. And we're going to need that guy down the stretch And into the playoffs. If we make it because we still have not clinched. James Starks, 11 carries, 71 yards, two touchdowns, one of those receiving. He was instrumental in both the running game and the passing game as well. Well, you got that one, two punch rolling. (laughs) This team is tough to stop because now they've got the run game going. And you still have Aaron Rodgers to worry about. Now, they have not been clicking clicking like we've known them to be clicking. But that does not make him or some of these receivers any less dangerous. But you've got Aaron Rodgers back there. You always have a chance. Go and ask Detroit that. This is the formula that needs to be played each and every single week for these guys to go and get to where they want. To win the division. Possibly get a number two seed because that's still up in the air. Go and make some noise in the playoffs. The goal is a Super Bowl. You have a shot to do all of that, but it has to be this way. It has to be on the strength of your running game because this offensive line, as beat up as they are, this offensive line is doing a fantastic job of run blocking. And we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago on toss. They are doing a better job of run blocking than they have been pass protection. You need to take advantage of that. Use that to your advantage. Get Lacey and Starks out there running the football. Hell, they gave they even, they gave Randall Cobb some carries. They gave John Coon some carries. Everybody got some handles on the ball. And we're pretty effective. Against again, against a good defense. This is the formula you need. This is the formula offensively you need. And I was so happy to see that. Yes, it had its frustrating times. What game does it have their frustrating times? They put up a legitimate 28 points on the board on the strength of this running game. And this passing game played as a complement to that. I look for this to be the formula for the rest of the season. 
and I look for success the rest of the rest of the season on offense if you continue to play like this. Now, the beautiful thing about playing offense like this is the fact that the number of passes are a little bit further down. Like, granted, he didn't Aaron Rodgers still passed the ball 35 times. But at the same time, when you run the football effectively or you run it more than you pass it, that really limits the chances of mistakes and putting the defense in tough positions. Short field, other guys get the ball, and more times than not, they're probably going to cash in on it because of the short field. They avoided that this Sunday. Did not turn the ball over. Did not put the defense in a precarious position. And that defense, that defense continues to be a top-notch unit on this ball club. You give up only seven points. Granted, yeah, Tony Romo is out. Not going to move the ball up and down the yard with Matt Castle. But you still got to go out there and execute. And that's what they did. They went out there and they executed. Sam Shields began the, began the game on Des Bryant. Des Bryant caught one ball for nine yards on Sam Shields. The rest of the game, after Sam Sam Shields got hurt, Demarius Randall, the rook, was on Des Bryant, one of the premier wide receivers in the NFL, and you've got a rookie on him, proceeded to shut Des down. Did not catch another football, did not gain another yard. One catch, nine yards, is all Des Bryant got all day long, and for a majority of that game, It was the rookie, Demarius Randall, that did that to him. If this guy is not in the running for defensive rookie of the year, everybody needs their votes taken from him. And they need to be given to other people. You cannot deny what this guy is doing on the field. It is amazing what he's doing on the field. He has pretty much come in. It's pretty much been a plug and play situation. He has come in and made an immediate impact. You know people are going to go and pick on him. He's a rookie. Of course they're going to go after him. A guy like Sam Shields, a guy who's won a world championship, a guy who's been a pro bowler, a guy who is one of the more underrated corners in the NFL and quite possibly is maybe on on the borderline of, of a shutdown corner. That Sam Shields, that guy who Mike McCarthy said he was playing some of the best football of his career this season, which I am in full agreement of. You step in for a guy like that and you go and you shut down one of the best wide receivers in the game. You deserve to be defensive rookie of the year. If he's not getting credit for that, if he's not getting any votes for that, y'all are absolutely doing it wrong. Completely wrong. So for as well as they did, the one thing I did find concerning were some of the big runs that the Cowboys were able to rip off, in particular, Darren McFadden. I believe he had a 40-plus yard run. He had a 50-yard run. You need to shore that up. Some of that is due to Dallas' offensive line. They're big. They're physical. One of the best offensive lines in the NFL. But you've got to shore that up. You can't start leaking on rushing defense when you're doing everything else well. Can't afford that. Cannot afford that. But overall, you give up seven points as a unit. You get a couple of sacks. Clay Matthews, welcome back to to Sac City. Glad to see you. It's been seven games. So glad to see you getting after the quarterback, finally. You hold those guys to seven points. You continue to play physical, shore up that run game. I mean, I think this defense is built for a very good playoff run if they continue to play like this. If the offense can continue to play like this, you're built for a very deep playoff run. Now, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. This Sunday, I believe, what, 305 out on the West Coast in Oakland, you have the Raiders, and we spoke a little bit about them on last week's toss. That is not a gimme. You're in the black hole. You're going against the Raiders, Derek Carr, Amari Cooper, Latavius Murray. They've got some weapons. They went into Denver and beat them in a slugfest. So they're they're getting it done defensively, but they're also getting it done offensively. You cannot take this game lightly. If you think this is going to be a layup, if you think this is going to be easy, it's a trap. You cannot afford to look 
to the following following week's game against the Cardinals, which has number two seed implications for you and them. You cannot afford to look past that. You need to take care of business against the Raiders. They are a tough bunch. They could come up and beat you. They've got weapons. You need to be ready. You need to be prepared for that. I'm looking forward to that game. I'm looking forward to seeing if we see the same sort of attack that we saw this Sunday against the Cowboys. Are we going to are we going to stay a run oriented team or are we going to revert back to that struggling offense where you're throwing the ball 40 and 50 and 60 times? I think with Mike McCarthy, I think that will not be the case unless it ends up being a shootout. But I have full faith that they are going to go into Oakland, into the black hole, pull out that win. And then you prepare yourself for a huge game again. Number two seed in the NFC playoffs. Big time implications regarding that on the line. On the line. In the following week against the Cardinals. Take care of business this Sunday against Oakland. Great performance this past Sunday against the Cowboys. Again, 28 to 7 straight domination on on all three facets. We didn't even talk about Jeff Janis and how he's become an an absolute special teams maven. Every single time there's some sort of a return, Jeff Janis was there to knock those guys down. He's really making his mark on special teams. So in all three phases of the game, they played extremely well or straight domination, wire to wire. Couldn't be more proud of those guys. 28 to 7, you move to 9 and 4. Full game lead in the NFC North over Minnesota. You have to continue to handle business. You have a chance to clinch a playoff spot if you win in Oakland this Sunday. So you have something to play for, but you need to go. You need to handle business in that game, then turn your attention to a huge game against the Cardinals the following Sunday. Great job, you guys. We're going to continue on the state of the state and travel over to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we had a playoff like atmosphere this past Saturday. The world champion Golden State Warriors came into town on an overall 28 game winning streak. 24 and 0 on the season. Facing the Bucks, who had once previously ended a long streak. Against the Lakers, 33-game winning streak, which is the longest in NBA history. Well, guess what? Long streak get beat. The Bucks beat, beat the Golden State Warriors, 108-95. Incredible atmosphere. Incredible play by the Milwaukee Bucks. They really played a complete game, and they dealt with a lot. Packed building, fans of both squads there, national coverage on NBA TV, all eyes are on you. This is the marquee matchup. Everybody's wondering, what are the, what are the Warriors going to do? Are they going to keep it going? They had a they had a tough overtime, double overtime game against the Celtics the night before. Are they ripe for the picking? And we'll get to that in a little bit. This was really a complete effort. With a little bit of adversity to, to overcome by the Milwaukee Bucks. First off, they played high level defense. Golden State for the game shot 40%. What do we call that here on Toss? We call that making it ugly. You want to hold those guys to 40% or less. They held them to 40% shooting. They only went 6 for 26 from 3. 23%. Three-point field goal percentage by the Warriors in that game against the Bucks. That's high-level defense. You hold Curry to 10 for 21 shooting. You hold Clay Thompson, <laughs> Clay Thompson from four to four for 14 from the field. And I know there's a lot of personal satisfaction uh, by some Bucks fans, especially after what Clay Thompson said this past summer to a group of eighth graders about how he was. He thanks God every day he woke up in the Bay because Milwaukee had a chance to to draft him. He just thanks God that didn't happen. There's some personal satisfaction that went down when watching him go four for 14 because of that Milwaukee Bucks defense. 
So high level defense, it was there. The perimeter defense was there. You forced those guys into some very tough shots. And again, Golden State did at some point have a lead in this game. I think their biggest lead was three points. So they dealt with some adversity of the world champions getting down, but then coming back, getting that lead. And then they did a great job locking back down, sharing the basketball, getting back into the game, taking the lead, growing the lead and keeping that lead. I talk about sharing the basketball. It was some good offense played. 31 assists on 44 made field goals for the Milwaukee Bucks. You shot 49% from the field. Very high percentage that is sharing the basketball, taking smart shots. Again, we say this ad nauseum on this show, but I'm going to say it again. That is taking smart shots. That is sharing the basketball. That is the formula you need to win games. 6 of 14 from 3. You shoot 42% from there. Very good percentage from three. Didn't need to take a whole lot. Again, 14 three-point field goal attempts. Six made. Again, very smart shots. Taking it inside. No mid-range. 18 foot. uh, Close to the basket. You really did the job there. Greg Monroe, absolute monster on Saturday. 28 and 11. I mean, we had some great games. Jabari Parker, 19 points, 7 rebounds. He's starting to look right again. Starting to look right again. Today, I believe today is the day, uh, one year ago to the day that uh, that he uh, tore his ACL. And they're playing against the Lakers. And last I checked, they were down 20-plus. So they kind of reverted back to ugly basketball again. Uh, Bad perimeter defense, getting out-rebounded, missing shots. Greg Monroe's out. Uh, uh, with a with a knee injury, Grievous Vasquez is out. Uh, he may be out three to four months because he had ankle surgery. Uh, so kind of dinged up on on this ball club. Uh, but there's no reason to get out rebounded, uh, play bad defense, and uh, and miss shots. So there, that's more than likely a loss to Los Angeles Lakers as we record this on a Tuesday for a Wednesday premiere. But back to the Warriors game. Some good news. Uh, Again, you play the formula you need to play in order to win games. When they play that way, they can hang with anyone, including the world champions. And not only did they hang with the world champions, (laughs) they hung an L on them. They won that game. Now, as good as everyone feels about this game, and some people are taking it way too far. You know, look, I'm a Bucs fan. I enjoy great wins by the Bucs just like anybody else. But I don't get overzealous about it. Yes, they broke the second longest streak in NBA history. Yes, they beat the world champions who may very well go back and repeat. These are all great things. It was a great atmosphere. Everybody feels good about it. But the thing is, this cannot be your season. This has to be a building block in your season. This has to be something that you can build upon. You you take that game. You say, you see what happens when we play this way? We can beat anyone, including someone who has not been beat. You have to use this as a learning tool. You have to use this as a building block. Guys, good things happen when we do this. Good things happen when we do this. But this cannot be your season. This cannot be your Super Bowl. This cannot be your NBA Finals. This has to be a building block for you guys to go and start playing consistently like that. And unfortunately, again, last I saw, they were down 20 plus points to to the Los Angeles Lakers, the three and 21 Los Angeles Lakers. More than likely, that's another L for the Milwaukee Bucks. So did they win? Did they learn anything? I don't know. It was it because Moose was out. Who knows? But they just flat out did not play well. They really did not use this. As a building block. And they're on a four game West Coast trip. And they're going to see the world champions again this Friday. And they're home. You would love to have gotten this one against the Lakers tonight. But that just did not. Or at least it it did not look to happen. Uh, I checked that score again. The last I saw it was in the third quarter. Uh, They were down 20 plus. So ugly. Ugly. But the thing that really made me mad. As far as this game goes. Had nothing to do with uh, with the play on the field. Had nothing to do, uh, you know. W- w- excuse me, with the play on the court. Had nothing to do with the players. Had nothing to do with something being said by any of the participant participants in this game. It had everything to do with a ton of media outlets uh, outside of Wisconsin, uh, nationally, state, whatever. 
really trying to take the shine off of what this team did. They try to say, oh, here's the thing. I was listening to a radio show uh, in Las Vegas uh, uh, called Eyes on the Game, uh, uh, host to Helen Yee. Shout out to her. We we conversed a little bit back and forth uh, a, a little bit. So shout out to her, Eyes on the Game. She had J.A. Adande. We, and everybody who follows ESPN basketball uh, coverage and, and, and all that and around the horn, uh, they know J.A. Adande, uh, you know, Works for ESPN, uh, writes columns, does some sideline reporting, is on around the horn, panelist. Uh, very knowledgeable basketball mind, uh, very good commenter, pretty decent writer. Um, he's good at what he does. Uh, but this really perturbed me. On her, on a shirt, on her show last night, He she asked him uh, how did they lose. And, and that's another thing that perturbed me. The story wasn't about the Bucks; It was all about the Warriors. And. I guess to the victor goes the spoils. They're the world champions. Uh, They were undefeated. Uh, So that's going to be a big story when those guys get beat for the first time when they just look flat out unbeatable. But she posed the question to him, how did the Warriors lose? And he effectively said, oh, well, uh, you know, they got caught on the last game of a seven game road trip. Double overtime against the Celtics. They were road weary. CBSSports.com even said the same damn thing. Oh, row, row weary Warriors lose their first. They completely made the story about the Warriors losing as opposed to what the Milwaukee Bucks did out there on the basketball court. Yes, the Warriors had a game Friday night against the Celtics that went into double overtime, and it took a lot of energy for them to come back in that game. It took a lot of energy for them to go and even win that game. The Celtics made it tough. They're a good young team. The Bucks had a game on Friday night against the Raptors. Raptors were putting it on for pretty good for the most part. And then the Bucks had to exert some energy to even make it close. And it was just a couple plays down the stretch that cost them that game. I believe it ended up being a 90-83 score that the Bucks lost by to the Raptors. And the Raptors are a good squad. So it's not like they played lesser competition the night before. You both had games the night before. You both were tired. You both were on the road. Again, J.A. Donde on Eyes on the Game last night was trying to say, oh, well, they probably didn't get to walk until like 3 or 4 a.m. And, and your body just isn't, isn't primed to perform 12 hours later at top notch and, and yada, yada, yada. The thing is, they did not say a single solitary positive word or a single solitary word about the Bucks whatsoever. That's the thing that makes me mad. Regardless of if a team came in from a double overtime game the night before, hell, the Bucks played too. A tough game. Regardless of that fact, you still have to go out there, show up, handle business the next night. You're all professionals. You all had a back-to-back. It was the second for both of you of a back-to-back. There is no excuse. They act like Golden State didn't have a lead in that game. I could see if it was a wire-to-wire win. Then I would say, hey, they were tired. They had no legs. That game the night before just took everything out of them. It's tough to come back on the back-to-back, and it is anyway, whether you win or lose, whether it's regulation or overtime or double overtime. It's tough to play on a back-to-back. But for them to completely take away, take the shine off of what the Bucks did and don't even mention their name and don't even mention what they did out in the court or even analyze it or break it down a little bit is disgusting to me. I know the Bucks are only a 10-win team after that game. I got you. The Bucks aren't doing what they should be doing, which is owning the future and, and, and making people fear the deer at this point. They're very inconsistent. I got that. But they played a hell of a game against the Warriors. And they deserve a lot more credit for what they did And they can't even get that. They got zero mention from many media outlets. And it's unfair. Don't make it about the Warriors losing their first game. Talk about what the Bucs did. Talk about how good the defense they played on the perimeter. Talk about how they forced those guys into some tough shots. Talk about how they forced Stephen Curry to under 50% shooting. Talk about how they held Klay Thompson to 4 for 14 from the field. Talk about how they held them to to six from 23 from three point. Talk about how Moose Monroe absolutely dominated the inside. 
Talk about how Jabari Parker is coming back to health. Giannis had a triple-double in that game, then it got taken away a couple days later. Talk about how his evolution is going along. Give the Bucks some damn credit for what they did. Don't make it, oh, well, the Warriors had a double overtime game the night before, and then they didn't get in until 4 a.m. Stop it with that. At some point, you got to give a team credit for coming out there. And just because they had an overtime, double overtime game the night before, doesn't guarantee that the Bucks are going to go in and beat them. That's why they play the games, folks. And you would think many of these media outlets, many of these people, many of these pundits and personalities and analysts and whatever you want to call them, as long as they've been in the business and as many games that they've seen, you would think they would give those guys some credit for what they went out there and did because they know you still have to go out there and play the game. The Bucks showed up, so did the Warriors. The Warriors had a lead in that game, so did the Bucks. And the Bucks ended up having the lead when it mattered most, which is when that clock hit triple zeros. Give credit where credit is due. The Bucks played a hell of a game. And I think if they, the way they played, even if the Warriors hadn't played a double overtime game the night before, they still would have won that game. Because that's how sound defensively they were and how together offensively they were. They dealt with adversity. Okay, the, the, Like I said, the Warriors had a lead in that game at one point. They dealt with that adversity of them having a the lead, coming back, digging their heels in, playing good defense, getting that lead, keeping it, and growing it. Give the Bucks some credit for what they did and stop trying to take the shine off of what they did. Bucks stop a 28-game streak against the Golden State Warriors, the world champs. 108-95. Hell of a job, guys. I wish you would have carried it over into tonight's game against the Lakers, but unfortunately that did not happen. But nobody could take away that effort. Nobody could take away that atmosphere. Nobody could take away that memory of breaking the second longest streak in NBA history at 28 games. And that's the state of the state, y'all. The Packers were dominant in their game against the Cowboys. 28-7 to win. Mike McCarthy took back the play calling duties as he should, should have done it weeks ago, but he did now. And you saw the difference in the play calling. The mentality has changed over to a run first offense with the passing game being a compliment to that. That is going to go a long way in helping this defense continues to be good. And that's what you're going to need for a long stretch run into the playoffs. If you make it again, you have a chance to clinch a spot against the Raiders this Sunday. You win, you're in. The Bucs had a hell of a win, stopped the second longest streak in NBA history at 28 versus the Golden State Warriors, 108-95, played a hell of a game, locked down defense, shared the basketball offensively, and the media (laughs) needs to stop taking the shine off of what they did. The Bucks are the one in 24 and one coming up on toss. We got to go back and revisit my predictions of UFC 194 and all my MMA heads right there. It was a hell of a fight card. We got to go and revisit and see what I got right and what I got wrong. And we got a bit of breaking news to talk about in the toss sweep. We'll get all that and then some next. Facebook.com slash T on Sports Show is your place for Toss on Facebook. We got a lot of stuff going on on there. A lot of things that we normally don't touch on on the show. So if you want to see all that, the place to be, Facebook.com slash T on Sports Show. That's T-O-N, Sports Show. Welcome back to Toss, everybody. Your friendly neighborhood, T-Squared, Trisha Thomas here with you. And it's time for us to run the toss sweep now now i said before that we had to revisit ufc 194 that great card uh ufc 194 i made some predictions on last week's toss and we have to revisit those we got to do it <laughs> we got to do it uh because if you watched if you looked at my twitter at the two zero double, 
you would know that I said that I was wrong about a lot of things on Saturday, and I could not be more happy about that. Uh, I, I said that the Bucks would lose to the Warriors. That did not happen. Uh, but now let's get to the UFC fight card. Uh, Yoel Romero against Ronaldo Souza. I said I was going to pick Romero in that fight. I got that one right. I got that one right. Romero did win that fight in a split decision. It really wasn't that exciting. Uh, Romero did drop Souza with a with a back fist. Um, I believe that was in the first round. But after that, uh, he really just coasted, got lazy, got sloppy, let Souza get back into the fight. Uh, was really a lackluster performance by him, especially after having been so explosive in his fight before. It, it was really a letdown fight for him, uh, in my opinion. Uh, let him get back into it. When you get a guy down, you got to go and finish him. Uh, he very, very easily could have come back and won that fight on split decision, but it goes Romero's way. So I was right about Yoel Romero winning that fight, <laughs> but that is uh, that's that's where the winning streak stops. Let's go over to the middleweight championship bout uh, between the champ, Chris Weidman, and the challenger, Luke Rockhold. I was wrong about this one. I picked Chris Weidman. I picked the guy who beat probably one of the greatest of all time, maybe even ever, Anderson Silva. Beat him twice. Beat him twice. I said I saw no reason for him to lose this fight. You go and beat one of the greatest of all time in Anderson Silva two times. You should not be losing really any fights. Well, he lost this in the rock hole, and he lost this in the rock hole in dominating fashion. Rock hole was pretty much ground and pound that guy. I, I, don't, I don't know how Herb Dean didn't stop the fight when he was ground and pounding him the first time. Apparently, he was still guarding himself. He it was still coherent enough to to put up his uh put up his guard, and Herb felt that he hey he's still defending himself. So the fight fan in you feels like okay, well we get more rounds. So I mean that's a good thing. It's a good non stoppage. And other people are like that fight should have been over. Rockhold just slaughtered the guy. Well, he ended up getting more ground to pound, and then the fight was over finally when he grounded upon him the second time. And Luke Rockhold is your new UFC middleweight champion of the world. And I did not expect that. I really did not expect that. But give credit to him. I said if this turns into a slugfest, it can go either way. And it went Rockhold's way. Went his way. So congratulations to you. I mean, that was totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. But if you want to talk totally unexpected, let's get to the main event. Of UFC 194. Let's talk about a fight that has been a long time in the making. Let's talk about how we were so looking forward to this fight in July. And then one guy gets hurt. And it turns into an interim featherweight bout. Interim championship bout for the featherweight championship. Here we are five months later. The fight is finally happening. Both guys healthy. Interim featherweight champion Conor McGregor, the the notorious one. UFC featherweight champion Jose Aldo, a guy who hasn't lost in 10 years. Literally, 10 years. One loss on his record. We're all looking forward to it. We're licking our chops. We're wringing our hands. All of us fight fans are just ready for it. Big John McCarthy gets in. All right. It's go time. McGregor comes in. Aldo rushes in. See a couple punches exchanged, a little kick to get some distance by by McGregor. And then it happened. Left hand flush on the jaw. Night, night, 13 seconds. Your new undisputed UFC featherweight champion of the world. Conor McGregor. I got this fight wrong. And it was very, very tough for me to pick it to begin with. I felt that McGregor had finally put it all together, especially over his past three to four fights. He's really put it all together. But I just felt that there was something about Jose. Like, look, the guy hasn't lost in 10 years. 
you know, I just, you know, he's been a hell of a champion. Uh, I just, you know, he's pissed off. He's in a mood. I mean, maybe he'll, maybe he'll pull this one out. I did not think that he was going to lose this fight. But again, I was so torn about picking it because McGregor's been on a roll. Aldo's been on a roll. And I did say last week on Toss, it will, will Aldo make a mistake and McGregor capitalize on that mistake because he's so emotional. He's so ready to rip his heart out. And it's not that Aldo made a mistake. It's just that McGregor hit him with a precise left on that jaw. And it was night night after that. I mean, it was it was the perfect strike. And he dropped him. 13 seconds. Fastest knockout in UFC title fight history. Uh, I mean, you you huh, I don't think we're ever gonna see that one broken. I mean, you would have to come in with a bicycle kick. <laughs> from from Jump Street <laughs> and it better hit flush in order to beat that record. It was amazing to see. I am happy for McGregor. I'm a McGregor fan. I mean, the guy, yeah, he talks, but guess what? He backs it up. So it makes it even more entertaining. So great fight card. So exciting. Uh the 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 rematch waters are looking a little bit weird. You would think that Aldo having been champion for as long as he was, for being uh, unbeaten for as long as he was, hadn't lost a, a fight in over 10 years, uh, you, he would get first crack at it. But now you're, you're hearing Frankie Edgar, who won his fight, might get that might get that chance. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't understand how Ronda Rousey gets her rematch against Holly Holm immediately, and Aldo doesn't get a chance to get his belt back immediately. It's It's kind of funny. I don't know what they're going to do with that. Uh, and from Connor's camp, they're saying he wants to hold a belt in two different divisions. So who knows what's going on with that? Uh, it's going to be a while before we see those guys fight again. I think they're, uh, they have to go and get some x-rays and, uh, some, some cat scans and things like that. Otherwise they're going to be medically suspended for six months. So they need to go and get some things checked out, keep themselves healthy. But, uh, McGregor has earned some definite, uh, well time, uh, some well, uh, deserved time off. Uh, three fights this year. He's been great. He's put it all together. Uh, again, undisputed featherweight champion of the world, Conor McGregor, the, the notorious one, dropped old Aldo, thirteen seconds, precise left hand. He predicted it. He said he would he would knock him out in the first round, but he didn't know it was going to be that fast. So, kudos to you, man. It was a hell of an experience. That that's for sure. You can't even call it the hell of a fight. It was a hell of an experience because I didn't think we would be seeing that. So 13 seconds, that's an experience. It's not really a fight, <laughs> but, but Hey, give him all the credit in the world. He went out there and he, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He was going to knock all the out in the first round. And that's what happened. You gotta love that. Gotta love when a guy talks and he goes out there and he backs it up. Gotta respect him for that. Now, I mentioned some breaking news, and this is the first time that we've gotten some breaking news into Toss. All right, this just happened. We all know that Bo Ryan said he was going to retire after this season, and then he came back and said, ah, well, you know, maybe I might stay. Who knows? Well, it is official. After tonight's win, he told the team, went out, made the announcement that this is it. I am retiring, and it's not after the season. It's effective immediately. Immediately. The Bo Ryan era is done. It, it was so sudden. I mean, you, you thought you had a full season left with them to, to enjoy it, to see what kind of noise they can make if they made it to the, the, uh, the NCAA tournament again. Obviously, you weren't thinking Final Four like you had been the past two seasons, but you're always interested in seeing what a Bo Ryan coach team can do because they usually get into the NCAAs and they usually make some noise. They usually are really tough out. So I was looking forward to that, but now Bo's gone. He's retired. Barry Alvarez came out and named Greg Gard the interim head coach for the rest of the season. I still think after the season he's going to do his due diligence. And Again, I spoke about this on the roundtable on Time on the Cable Sports Channel with Dennis Krause and Tom Pippins. 
I think that he was kind of doing the waffling thing to kind of lobby guard for the job. Guard's got an audition now. He's the interim head coach. Um, he, he's really his pick. He wants him to be that successor, and he's got his opportunity now to show what he's made of the rest of the season. So Barry Alvarez, I still think he's going to do his due diligence, uh, interview some other guys. He's going to interview guard as well. He's going to really take into account what he does with this team the rest of the way. If he gets them into the NCAAs, uh, if he gets them to play a little bit better than they have been because they've had some awful losses and multiple losses at the Cole Center this season. I think they've got three losses at the Cole Center this season. That's unheard of, especially in, in the Bo Ryan era. So he's got his audition now. He's got everybody coming out, uh, talking about it. Frank Kaminsky, you know, just can't thank Bo Ryan enough for, for what he's done for him. Nigel Hayes is pretty much saying, hey, we wish him luck. On uh on on his future endeavors and whatever old people do, <laughs> that's simply to the effect that he said. You know, Nigel Hayes is good for a good quote. Um, everybody's coming out and just really showing their love, their appreciation, their respect uh, for Bo Ryan. Dick Vitale sent out some tweets. Uh, you know, they got his stats posted all over the place. Uh, you know, multiple, uh, uh, I think seven Big Ten championships. Uh, 14 NCAA uh, um, seasons. I mean, it, it's it's just incredible, his run. 300-plus wins, uh, the most in Badger basketball history. Does he supplant Dick Bennett as being the face or the legend in Badger's basketball history? Yeah, possibly, yeah. You know, but, I mean, obviously you're going to remember both of them. They're both legends of Badger's basketball. But when you think Badger basketball, now more so than than ever, you think Bo Ryan and everything he's done. Back to back Final Fours, uh, consistently in the NCAA tournament, always making noise in that tournament. Multiple Big Ten championships, uh, and again, Wisconsin's all time winningest head coach uh, in, in basketball. Gotta love and respect that man. His teams took on his toughness, uh, his grit, his determination, his mentality, and you really saw it out there on the court. They really grinded it out. Uh, that was his mentality. Tough, you know, hard-nosed defense and playing a very smart brand of offense, that swing offense. It, it, it's proven to be very consistent. And it's proven to be a winning formula. Now, again, just go back and look at all his stats. Look at everything he's done for Wisconsin basketball. So thank you, Bo. Thank you for everything. Uh, enjoy your retirement. It's so sudden. We thought we were going to have this entire season with you, but uh, you decided that it was time to go now. Again, Greg Gard is your interim head coach for the remainder of the season, possibly longer than that, but we'll see. But I think I speak for the entire state of Wisconsin, basketball fans, college basketball fans everywhere, everyone who's covered this game. When I say, thanks, Bo, you're going to be missed. This is Toss. All right, y'all, it's time for me to get on up out of here. This is your friendly neighborhood, T-Squared, signing off from episode 15 of the Tristan on Sports Show Toss. We're moving right along. Hey, you guys know my Twitter handle, at the 20 double. That's at the 20 double on Twitter. Live tweets, debates. You guys know I keep it entertaining on there. So, again, at the 20 double on Twitter. We're also on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash T on Sports Show. That's T O N Sports Show. We got a lot of things on there that we don't get a chance to cover on the show. So, that is your place to go and see some extra bits, bites, and anecdotes. So, again, facebook.com slash T on Sports Show. That's T O N Sports Show. You know, we're on iTunes. You know we're on Stitcher. We're also on Libsyn. That's Toss Show. T-O-S-S-S-H-O-W dot Libsyn. L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Catch all of our brand new episodes on there. And then also go back and take a listen to all of our other episodes. We got <laughs> Now we got 15 up for you. So go ahead. Catch up on Toss. I think you're going to like what you hear. But as I said before, it's time for me to get on up out of here. This is Tristan Thomas reminding all of you that dreams don't catch themselves. Get up, get out, and get after it. Until next week, so long from TOSS.